Canceled, um, and what was the other announcement I was going to make? Oh, it was that I will introduce the session chair, who is Peter Bauman, uh, who is from Yakum's University in Rosamond, and will chair session three, which is all about maintaining big data. Um, and so we're a little bit behind, so having uh, cancellation isn't a bad thing. <laughs> That's what we are having here. But on the other hand, we see some really down-to-earth engineering here. <laughs> so, uh, paper towels is a holder for the microphone. And it works. It works. Okay. So, back again. I hope you have uh, had a good break and good talks. <coughs> now, we get some more presentations. And we are walking our way through the data issue. Now it's about maintaining data. And we know that data quickly erode in their quality and in all aspects they need to be maintained, <coughs> updated, and by the way we want to access them. This is not really new. We are doing this since decades. And actually there is some role model in business data and that is SQL. We don't use that so much for scientific data uh, because of a few uh, issues, but uh, things are coming and this is something where I'm really glad that we have our first presenter uh, that's with us today. No, I'm not going to dance now. We have a nice mix actually of presenters. Uh, we have an expert from SQL itself. Uh, we have uh, agency, USGS, 
and we have open source available. And that's a good, that's a good mix uh, for this slot. Let me start by introducing Keith here. He is from uh, JCC and a uh, convener of ISO, IEC, JTC1, that's a Joint Technical Committee 1, Subcommittee 32, Working Group 3, and if you don't know what that is, that is SQL. Those guys who are maintaining the SQL language, and he is giving us his perspective on how to access data and how to maintain data. So, Keith, I would like to call you on stage and make way for you. A lot of what I'm going to talk about in this session is going to sound really familiar because it's um, reiterating a number of things that have been said in the last couple of, of talks. And hopefully what I'll be able to do is to um, sort of put things in a, a higher level framework to, to think about these things. Um, I'm, my background is databases and SQL and databases are cool. I like doing databases. But the, the thing is, is that the data isn't the ultimate reason for doing big data type things. The ultimate reason for doing it is to be able to get some sort of information. Uh, one of the terms that I'm going to use is actionable analytics, to get an answer, to get something that you can do something with. So the, 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 the actionable analytics, the output, <coughs> The visualizations are the ultimate goal of big data, but being able to store and retrieve and analyze the data is a prerequisite. So what I'm going to talk about is, is the prerequisites, not the ultimate, um, the ultimate answer. So who am I? Um, I've been doing high performance database systems for a few years. In my day job, I'm a database consultant. One of the things I do for fun is SQL standards. It could be argued that I have a strange sense of fun. <laughs> but I ended up, I've been involved in the US SQL Standards Committee for a long time. And I ended up as the vice chair of the committee um, about 10 years ago. I ended up as the convener of WG3, the, the long string that um, Peter just rattled off. And so far, nobody's been willing to fire me. So it either means I'm doing OK or nobody else really wants the job. Um, Jeff talked about the NIST Big Data Study Group, and which led to um, a study group on focusing on standards. And I actually chaired the US <coughs> counterpart to the Insights um, JTC1 study group on big data. And when that completed, I ended up as um, originally as chair of the US Big Data Technical Committee, but then I got myself promoted to vice chair. And I actually went to school a long time ago. Uh, one of the things about technology is it changes and new stuff um, um, is introduced. So when I went to school, databases were just being coming around. And so I have had to learn. All, all sorts of things since then. One of the things to remember about big data is that 30 years ago, this was big data. And what we're calling big data now in 30 years is going to be this. So when we do architectures and things to handle big data, we have to think in terms of not the absolute limits today, but how we can structure things so that we can handle what's going to be coming down the road as technology changes, as data volumes increase, and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why big data is different, um, throw in some buzzwords, um, a, sort of a high level view, and talk about some of the, the types of things in the big data ecosystems. When George started email, emailing me uh, back in August about doing a talk for this event, there was a Dilbert cartoon that um, you should go look up. Uh, but to quote the pointy-haired box, 
let's do a deep dive in the big data and drill down until we can hyper-localize some disruptive technologies. <laughs> so what's big, how's big data different? As an earlier speaker mentioned, it's often in times of, uh, defined in terms of these uh, three or four or now seven V's in one presentation I found. And I've been thinking of just going off to the dictionary and see how many V's I can come up with. Uh, that would be some sort of victory. <laughs> one of the focuses really is, and, and the V's are important, but it, it doesn't give you a good, def, a good complete definition. It's really, the V's are marketing, and the marketing of the technology is useful, but it's not the final answer. But one of the focuses is looking at the primary data and distributing the analysis rather than trying to extract and transform and load. Um, the basic issue is that the data has gotten big enough that we can't afford to take the time to bring the data to the analysis. We have to ship the analysis to the data. So in many ways, um, big data is what we've been doing for years. It's just bigger and more complex. The driving forces really are the ability to inexpensively store large volumes of data. Now one of the things to think about is what's the cost of a terabyte of data, of, of terabyte of storage? And it's actually gone down rapidly and it's going to continue to decrease in the next 15 or 20 years. We have inexpensive compute power. So what we're looking at is what's sometimes called um, next generation analytics. You know, it used to be that you would do a sample of the data and analyze the sample because you couldn't possibly analyze it all. So what we're trying to do now is instead of analyzing just a 1% or 5% sample, we're trying to analyze all of the data. We're trying to move from um, offline analytics to online, inline, um, immediate analytics so we get answers immediately, not um, three weeks later. So we can predict what's going to happen, not say what happened last year. So to do this, um, we're going to be operating on and are operating on data that's stored someplace. But uh, as um, Jeff was talking about, data in motion, streaming data. So do analysis of the data before it actually gets stored, or maybe instead of actually storing it. And probably the big thing is that instead of just looking at rows and columns of characters and numbers, we're looking at all sorts of um, different kinds of data sources. So as a working definition, um, I'm going to use the term requirements can't be met on a single computer. And so you have to spread things out across multiple computers, and um, then you replicate data for availability, which is sort of a V word. And you distribute the processing. So how big is big? It used to be that we thought petabytes were big. Um, we're now talking about exabytes, and zettabytes, and yottabytes. And, and I don't want to limit us. After yottabytes, one of the terms that's being used is brontobytes and then gigabytes, but those are not official terms yet, so that terminology could change. <laughs> and I haven't found a term for anything bigger than a gigabyte. But as we do architectures, let's think in terms of really big. Um, have you ever read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Well, then you know that space is really, really, really big. <laughs> let's, let's plan for that. I want to talk about some buzzwords that um, you're going to hear. And the buzzwords are buzzwords, but it's useful to understand so that when somebody starts talking about sharding and MapReduce and schema lets, you have some idea of what they're talking about. Now, to some extent, any time I talk about big data, my background of doing commercial databases and then doing the SQL standard is going to influence what I think about this. And, and so, you know, I might not be completely correct, but I'm mostly correct. Mostly completely correct. 
<laughs> so one of the buzzwords you're going to hear is probably have heard is NoSQL. And if you go off to the website NoSQLdatabases.org, you see about, I don't know, 200 plus databases listed. And their original char common characteristic was that they didn't include SQL. They rejected the complexity of SQL. But it turns out that SQL is actually a powerful language for specifying queries. And so what's happened is a lot of the NoSQL databases have begun inter uh, implementing a general purpose